So now that we've talked about caching to VDB, we should really talk about rendering volumes. It's a bit more of a complicated process than you think, especially if you're rendering for visual effects or anything high res. Volumes are a little special. So in the folder, you're going to have a file called Cloud Low Render Settings. Open that up. And this will take a minute to come through while it sorts itself out. But eventually you should end up with something that looks a bit like this. So this is the same method as we put together our cloud volumes, just with a bit more attention paid to it, let's say. Feel free to go through the file as always. It's fairly well uh, labeled. It shows you what it does. But the big difference here is two things. One is your volume scope, which we'll get to in a minute. And the next one is your output. You'll notice that this, after the material has been assigned to the volume, and remember material is how we see volumes in the viewport, it's also plugged into the final output. And this is so you can render it. If, this, if anything is plugged into that final output, Arnold will see and render it. So let's talk about how Bifrost is different for volumes. And it is, it's different. It's pretty much one of a kind. To do this, we need to talk about sparse volumes, spatially adaptive volumes, tiles, tile trees, that kind of stuff. If we just hide everything, which will take a second. And let's turn on the diagnostics. And what the diagnostics are showing us, if we just switch back to the perspective camera, what the diagnostics are showing us here is a slice through this volume. That's what this mesh plane is doing. This is what the volume scope is doing. Very handy node this. What this is showing you is your tile tree. If you come down here, you can see display tile tree is on, visible levels of five, various other display attributes. I'm just going to turn the volume off for a second. So remember, this is a slice through that volume, and you can see what we've got here. Each one of these cubes represents a level of the voxel tile tree, and that's because Bifrost is a spatially adaptive volume which means that you have voxels of different sizes. This is the thing that Bifrost does that is different from everything else. For most other volumes, you're going to have all of the voxels the same size. And if it's a sparse volume like this is, you will have as many of these little cubes as your resolution dictates going all the way out until there's no more volume anymore. So the difference here is that this is still a sparse volume. There is only voxels where there needs to be voxels to carry the data, to show the volume, to do all that good, sort of good stuff that we do with volumes. But you've got higher res voxels where there is more resolution needed. And that's the difference with Bifrost. Let me just illustrate this for a second. So if you were to look at the tile tree of the VDB, it would look something like this. You can see that the voxels are sparse. There are no voxels where there doesn't need to be voxels, but every single voxel is exactly the same size. So what this means is that any resolution change you have baked into your volume in Bifrost using an adaptive sparse system is gone once you convert it to VDB. This makes VDB a trade-off, very much a trade-off. What it's really like is it's, it's like baking something or even more than caching, it's you are baking it down to its highest resolution. I don't need big voxels and little voxels. I just want all the voxels at the highest resolution possible. The trade-off comes with disk space. If you are doing a 5,000 frame shot, with volumes in it, and those volumes of VDB, those files are going to get really big. If they're adaptive, like Bob, which is the cache file we just talked about, not as big. On the other side, only Bifrost and Arnold will read and render Bobs. Almost everything reads and renders VDB. VDB is an open format, so it's open VDB. So if you compare this one, where every every voxel, yes, this is just a mock-up and I made it. Don't look at the, don't look at the graph. If you compare this one as a VDB tile tree to what we had before, so if we just look at the slice of this volume, or even if you wanted to look at the whole volume, you can see that you have the smallest 
voxel size and it gets bigger from there, bigger again, till you're right out at the edge with the blue ones and those are the biggest still. So this is the way that Bifrost does it and Bob does it. This is going to be a lot smaller on disk, but like I said, the trade-off is only Bifrost and Arnold read and render these. It's kind of a pros and cons thing. I mean, if you are only ever going to be working in Bifrost and Arnold, then this is the way to go. They use less space. They're, easy. they're, they're just better, well, they're, they're more adaptive, basically. That's why they're called adaptive volumes or adaptive tile trees. Speaking of tile trees, what you're looking at is the tile tree. We've talked about tiles. We've talked about the number of voxels in a tile and things like that. But a tile tree is the tree of the tiles. And the reason it's a tree is that you've got different sizes, almost like branches on a trunk. So if the red one's the smallest size, the highest resolution was the trunk, then the orange ones would be the next, the first branch out. The green ones would be the second. Blue ones would be the third. It goes like that. It's a tree. Whereas with a VDB, see if I can break everything, with a VDB, there is no tree. There is just a large number of tiles. How automatic does this need to be? Well, you really only need to know it when you're converting to VDB. And you kind of need to weigh up your options. It's going to be heavily studio dependent. It's going to be what you want to use, whether you've got the disk space to store it, whether you're going to be rendering in another render engine like V-Ray or Mantra or, or Cycles or whatever. All of these choices come into it. So really you're only going to need to know that the real depths of this when you're converting to VDB and when you're setting up an adaptive simulation. We haven't got to simulation yet, but we will get there. Okay, so that's, that's the main difference. That's enough talking. Let's get on to rendering stuff. So if I come back to this guy, this is our Bifrost setup. That's where I output to VDB there in a file cache node. We can get rid of that. And this is set up to render an Arnold. I'll need to switch on the render tab and then you'll get the volume. I've already got a camera set up in here for you to use if you want to use it. Switch to that. You can see there are lights. You can see that the viewport is giving us an idea of what that volume will look like. Now to render out of Arnold, it's pretty simple really. You just go to the Arnold render view, which is this one. And you see I've got a couple of test renders here already. And you hit update. Now I'm going to pause. Well, you can hit render as well. You can hit IPR here as well. So it'll render as you change things. Now I'm going to pause while this renders and then I'll be right back. And it's rendered. Now we have to talk about render settings and we're going to get into this. We're going to get into this into a lot more depth in a week or two. So we're going to talk very heavily about render settings in two weeks time. Just really quickly to run through them now because knowing how to render is, is a really good thing. In Maya, you find your render settings up here in this bar or you switch this guy to rendering. Go to the render menu, first one on the menu, render settings. You have tabs across the top, common Arnold renderer system, AOVs and diagnostics. You want the Arnold renderer. The Arnold renderer is going to render everything for you. And this is where you control how it does that. Now, you can see this is quite grainy. This guy took seven minutes and 45 seconds to render. And these settings here under sampling control the quality. All right, so in a minute, I'm gonna set these up higher and render again to show you the difference. But basically these are the samples for each of these things. In your render. So camera anti-aliasing, four samples, the highest one. Diffuse lighting, specular lighting, transmission, so transparency or, you know, windows. This cloud has some transmission in it. You're seeing through the density. Subsurface scattering and volume and direct. This section, the sampling, this is the quality. To actually control how it renders, you need to go to the ray depth section. And this is how many bounces your rays have. So this is a total of six bounces, one for diffuse, which means the ray from the camera is going to bounce off once, or the, the, the ray is going to bounce once. 
Same as specular, twice for transmission because we want it to go through, twice for volume because it's a volume, and our transparency depth is six for six bounces basically. So this is very definitely low settings and it is still taking seven minutes a frame to render because volumes are big and heavy and difficult. There are over 96 million voxels in this cloud. Maya and Arnold and Bifrost all have to get their ducks in a row to get all of that information rendered onto the screen. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change some of these settings to show you the difference. Okay, just so you're aware, the snapshot here, 7 minutes and 11, 15, this is a much higher res, but it's still not quite high enough snapshot, took 15 minutes. So this is snapshot 2 is what we've just rendered at these settings. So let's go ahead and set these up to 2 and 2 and 2 and 2 and 4. And then all of these guys should add up to this total. So what I need to do is I'm going to put my transmission to 4, my volume to 4, diffuse and specular to 2, 4 and 4 and 2 and 2 is 12. Take that to 12. All right. So I am going to pause the video now because I'm expecting this to take quite a long time and I will be back with the results for you instantly for me later on this afternoon and go. and we're back the render's finished it took 46 minutes which basically was just doubling these settings we look at our first one and see that it appear its appearance has changed so with higher settings comes higher quality comes higher time it's the trade-off that you're always running into when you're rendering volumes. So this seven minute job might be pretty good for an iteration. Is it looking right? Do I need to change something? Can I work this out, work that out? And when, I'm, when you're ready, you go across to the higher res one. And this is still not completely perfect. It's still noisy. There's still things that need to be done on it. But I just wanted to give you an example of what different render settings will do. You can see the samples here. This is the higher res one. This is the lower res one. So they're both at 1280 by 720. And it's just that one took seven minutes and one took seven times as long as that. So keep your render settings in mind. Make sure you understand what you're outputting this for. Is it a game sprite? Is it a VDB to be exported? Is it a VFX project? How close to camera is it? How detailed does it need to be? All of these things need to come into your mind when you're deciding to use a volume how to use a volume, all of that kind of thing, especially if you're rendering it. So that's the that's how easy it is to render things in Bifrost from the volume setup. And this is not moving. This is just a still volume. It's a cloud. Um, this is how easy it is to render things in Arnold from Bifrost. You put a shader on it right there. You put make sure that it's plugged into the final. You make sure final is turned on and you render it or you just grab this and plug it into an output. We'll be going more into depth with VDB output in a couple of lessons because we're going to be caching our stuff out to VDB so that we can just import it into Unreal as a VDB. I did need to show you the different ways of rendering things. So now we'll do the VDB. Now I've already made a VDB, so we'll just throw down a file cache node. Like that. We don't need to connect anything. We're going to take it to read mode and we'll go and navigate to the VDB I saved out earlier. Make sure this is set to open VDB. And this is the one I cached out. I actually cached out one with all of the settings and one with only some of the settings. So I'm going to take my, my density. Yep, because I'm reading it. There we go. This brings in all of the properties. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to switch these off completely just so that it's faster for us to work. And I'm going to replace the incoming thing into this material with my VDB. And I'm just going to make sure I really don't turn on. Well, no, we can because we can see what a Bifrost does to a VDB import. So when Bifrost imports a VDB, it generates the tile tree. So it's converting VDB to a Bifrost volume internally. So you are still working with a sparse volume, but once it comes in, it becomes an adaptive sparse volume, which means, like I said before, 
there are only voxels where there need to be voxels. There's no voxels going out into infinity here. They stop. And those voxels are a different resolution. So Bifrost converts the VDB when you bring it in. And that looks pretty similar to, I had to go back and double check. I didn't leave that plugged in. That looks really similar to what we generated here. It's just now a single file cache. So we're no longer making Bifrost calculate all of the volume stuff here. We've cached it out. We've baked it. We've baked it to a high resolution file where all of the voxels are the same size and at the highest resolution that we've set up. We've put the same material on it and that's worked fine. We've assigned that material. I'm going to once more pause the video for about 45 minutes and then we compare, can compare the results of the two. Let's make sure final is switched on. Go back to our Arnold render. This will just take a minute. There's our low res for one, 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 one. Yep. And there's our higher res for two, 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 four. Let's use the higher res one. And that way we, the next render we do, which we'll do just by hitting update, we'll be able to compare this one and that one, both in terms of time and in terms of quality. All right, I'm going to hit render now and then pause the video. So there we go. That's pretty similar. 46 and a half versus 47, almost 48. Looks very similar too. So just to show you, you can render both ways. The thing you can do with the VDB that you can't do with a Bifrost cache, a Bob file, or just a Bifrost file is you cannot render it in anything other than Arnold. That's your trade-off. Okay, so that's pretty much everything. Like I said, you're not gonna, I'm not gonna go too deep in the weeds on this. You're really just gonna need to know what your output is for, depending on whether you want to choose this. There's adaptive simulation, but we haven't got up to simulation yet, so I'm not going to go into that one just yet. But basically, when you're exporting for someone else or something else, you're exporting a volume to VDB to be rendered somewhere else or to be imported into an engine, that's when you need to know that when you use a VDB, you are baking the volume down to just one resolution. And if that's what you need, that's what you need. That's fine. You want to stand by Frost and do it, you stand by Frost and do it. All right, let's move on to getting VDBs into the engine.